now to Laboratory 2, Culture of Cells Growing in a Monolayer and in Vitro Cytotoxicity Testing. In this lab, we're going to do a cytotoxicity assay, which is basically an assay for cell death. Cytotoxicity is one of the most basic concerns for developing new materials that house or contact cells and is often the first step in determining whether a material is a viable candidate for any application within the body, including applications involving tissue engineering. A number of regulatory boards, including ASTM and the International Organization of Standardization, ISO, have developed standard procedures to determine whether a biomaterial is cytotoxic or not. In this lab, we will be following an ISO standard. Conducting this test will not only teach you about biocompatibility of certain materials and about healthy and dead cell morphology, but it will also get your feet wet with doing basic cell culture in monolayers. This is an important building block to later labs in the semester where you will be culturing cells in three-dimensional scaffolds. And by the end of this lab, you'll be able to say which of these figures, A, B, C, or D, represent healthy, viable cells and which do not, although you can probably venture a guess right now. A number of different cytotoxicity assays have been developed, including direct contact tests, agar diffusion, and elution tests. As a basic rule, anything present in a biomaterial or like on the surface or inside of it that interferes with cell metabolism or protein synthesis will be cytotoxic. So this can be the material itself, any additives, or any potential degradation products. These cytotoxicity assays are aimed at determining that. The simplest cytotoxicity assay is the direct contact assay, which is the one that we will be doing. Here, a small piece of test material is placed over top of a monolayer of cells in a culture plate. After 24 hours in the incubator, the cells in the area underneath and around the sample are examined under the microscope. Cells that are no longer living are usually floating. The assay is mainly qualitative, meaning that you include a positive or a non-cytotoxic and a negative, a completely cytotoxic, control so that the degree of cytotoxicity of your sample can be ascertained by comparing the cell morphologies under the microscope. Keep in mind that for the assay to work, your biomaterial has to be light. You can't crush the cells underneath it, right? The agar diffusion assay is similar to the direct contact assay, except the cells that are in a monolayer at the bottom of the plate are actually covered in a porous agar gel. Agar is derived from red algae, and it looks and feels almost exactly like gelatin or jello. And your biomaterial is actually placed on top of the agar gel, so it won't squish your cells if it, if it happens to be heavy. The agar is infused with cell culture media to keep the cells alive, and the viability is determined by the same method as the direct contact assay, which is just examining the cells under the microscope and looking at their morphology. Now, in an elution assay, this type of assay is to determine the cytotoxicity of leachable molecules found in biomaterials, such as unreacted monomers or degradation products. In this assay, your material is immersed in an aqueous media, like cell culture media, or a biocompatible oily media, for 24 hours, so anything leachable will diffuse out of your biomaterial and into the media. And this media is called the extract. After 24 hours, the extract is applied over the cell monolayer for 24 more hours, and afterwards the cell viability is determined by the same methods as in the previous two assays. And the objectives of this laboratory will be to assess the cellular morphology under a light microscope and with a fluorescent assay, to describe basic equipment used in cell culture, to explain and perform basic cell culture techniques of disaggregation, 
quantitation and reseeding of cells, to explain and perform an in vitro direct contact cytotoxicity assay on an alginate hydrogel, and to evaluate qualitative data related to the interaction between living and non-living materials. The materials for this lab, uh, each group will receive three tissue culture plates containing a monolayer of NIH 3T3 fibroblasts. They'll receive cell culture medium, trypsin, a 24 well plate, a 15 milliliter conical tube for collecting cells, methanol graded for cell culture, a 1% solution of sodium alginate, a 2% solution of calcium chloride, a live dead viability stain in a quantity of 3.5 milliliters, and a pair of tweezers. In terms of equipment for this lab, you'll need an inverted fluorescent microscope, a laminar flow hood, an incubator, which is kept at 37 degrees Celsius with 5% CO2, a water bath at 37 degrees, automatic pipettes, and a hemocytometer. Now some basic procedures which you may already know. You always have to wear appropriate personal protective equipment during these labs. That includes gloves, safety goggles, closed-toed shoes, and long pants. Wash your hands thoroughly before starting your work and before leaving the laboratory and make sure to wipe down the surface of the hood and all the materials that are placed into the hood. To start the lab, each group will receive a confluent plate of NIH 3T3 cells. This is a cell line that was established in 1962 from a mouse embryo by two scientists at NYU. Fibroblasts are cells that generate extracellular matrix molecules in connective tissue, like collagen and glucosaminoglycans. We chose this cell line because it's relatively hardy, they grow quickly, and are a standard cell line for biocompatibility studies such as this. Now once you are given your plate, remember, you have to keep the plates completely covered any time they are out of the tissue culture hood in order to avoid contamination. With that in mind, take a brief look at your plate under the inverted microscope to examine the cell morphology. And now that you have your plate, you'll be ready for the next phase of the experiment, disaggregation. Now the aim here is to reseed the cells in a different vessel. In order to do so, you have to detach the monolayer in the current vessel and then transfer them to a new vessel. For this, we add a compound called trypsin to the cells. Once trypsin is added, the cells are called trypsinides. When added to a cell culture, trypsin breaks down the proteins which enable cell adherence to the vessel. So in order to do this, first, you need to retrieve warmed media and warm trypsin from the water bath, and remember to spray the outside of these containers with alcohol solution before placing them in the hood. Now in order to start this process, what you'll do is You'll take your free hand, you'll open the lid of a tissue culture plate, tilt it towards you, collect the cell culture media, and drop it into the liquid waste container. And then what you're going to do is you're going to retrieve one milliliter of trypsin from the vessel, and you'll carefully drop it into your tissue culture plate. And then you will gently agitate it in order to distribute the trypsin. And you'll incubate it at 37 degrees and 5% CO2 uh, for five minutes. And once you remove it from the incubator, uh, you'll bring it back into the hood where you'll probably start to note portions of the monolayer coming loose from the bottom of the plate. And then it's time to add five milliliters of fresh uh, warm cell culture medium to the plate. So here you see we're aspirating up that quantity and adding it to the tissue culture plate. And you want to make sure to add it over the entire surface of the plate. This is to help to detach or bring up the monolayer of cells. 
and then you can collect the cell suspension in the pipette and then carefully oops carefully transfer the cell suspension to the 15 milliliter conical tube now that you have your cell suspension in your 15 ml conical tube it is time to determine how many cells there are per milliliter of media quantitation like this is important in cell culture for the characterization of cells and to establish reproducible culture conditions. And one way to achieve cell quantitation is to use a hemocytometer. To use a hemocytometer, you'll make sure, first of all, that your cell suspension is uniform. So that may take uh, the effort of slowly pipetting the cell suspension up and down a few times with the pipette aid, or you can gently vortex your 15 ml conical tube as long as you're sure that it's sealed. And once you're sure that it's uniform, you'll remove 10 microliters of the suspension with the micro pipette and add it to each side of the hemocytometer as indicated by the yellow arrows in this picture. The hemocytometer basically consists of an optical flat chamber placed under the microscope. The cell number within the defined area of known volume is counted, and then your cell concentration is determined. So what you see here is that we have the hemocytometer and the micropipette ready. It's set to 10 microliters. Hey, we're grabbing a new pipette. We're grabbing 10 microliters of cell suspension. It's a very small amount. It's practically a drop. And you're going to place it in the hemocytometer. Okay, and then what you don't see here is that we're, we do the other side as well, and then you take it over to the microscope for examination. Okay, and so when you make it over to the microscope, this is the view um, that you'll see. Uh, of the hemocytometer slide. And this is under 10x magnification. So the central area enclosed by the white square here is approximately one millimeter by one millimeter by 0.1 millimeter depth, which means that the volume of the chamber you're looking at in the white square is 0.1 millimeter cubed or one times 10 to the four times 10 to the minus four milliliters. So if we want to find the cells per milliliter in your cell suspension, all we need to do is count the number of cells in this chamber and divide by its volume. However, to save time, it's convention to only count the total number of cells in a certain number of squares. And a very common uh, way of doing this is to only count five of the squares. So we're adding up the number of cells in each of the five squares highlighted in blue here. That would be equivalent to one-fifth the total volume of the square outlined in white. Now when you're counting, make sure you don't count any of the cells twice and only count the cells that um, are at least partially in the blue square. In other words, don't count those that are lying entirely on the line, like what that orange arrow is highlighting. You wouldn't count that cell. So once you have a total number, in this case it's about 24, you'll repeat on the other side of the hemocytometer, because remember you took two samples, and then you'll average those two values. For example, if on this side we got 24 and on the other side the count was 18, then your average cell count in the chamber will be 21. Now the cell concentration, as I mentioned before, can be calculated with the average cell count, that's the average of the two values from the hemocytometer, divided by the chamber volume. So for the volume of the chamber, if you counted those five squares, your actual volume is one-fifth times the volume of the white square, which is one times 10 to the minus fourth. So doing this calculation, uh, with an average of uh, cell count of 21, divide that by 1 fifth times 1 times 10 to the minus 4th, and this gives us a total of 1.05 times 10 to the 6th 
cells per milliliter in our cell suspension. Now the following numbers are fixed, fixed numbers that you're going to use in this experiment. They come from previous work with using these cells. So what you want is you want to have a cell suspension of 7.6 times 10 to the fifth cells per mil. And based on the number of samples we want to generate, you need four milliliters total of this cell suspension. Now remember your cell suspension or the one that we're, the sample one that we're working with now is 1.05 times 10 to the sixth cells per mil. So in this calculation here, I'm going to have to dilute that cell suspension. In order to calculate this dilution, remember the equation C1V1 equals C2V2. Here, C1 is the concentration of undiluted cell suspension. V1 is the volume of the original solution used for the dilution. C2 is the desired cell concentration. And V2 is the volume after dilution. So in this case, V1 is our unknown, V2 is 4 milliliters, and C2 is 7.6 times 10 to the fifth. That's our desired cell concentration. That's fixed. And in this example, our C1, the concentration of undiluted cell suspension, is 1.05 times 10 to the sixth. So solving for V1 here, you get 2.89 mils. So what this means is that you need to take 2.89 mils of your existing cell suspension that's in the 15 mil conical tube. You're going to transfer it to another 15 mil conical tube and then dilute it up to 4 milliliters with fresh cell culture media. Now you'll have 4 milliliters of a cell suspension that contains 7.6 times 10 to the fifth cells per mil. And now you'll take 300 microliters of your newly diluted cell suspension, okay, make sure it's uniform first, and you'll take those 300 microliters with a micropipette and transfer them into each of 12 wells of a 24 well plate, as you can see in this diagram. So you'll place cell suspension in wells A1 through A4, B1 through B4, and C1 through C4. And this is basically the process of reseeding the cells into a new vessel. And so if you're taking 300 microliters of cell suspension, that means you're actually seeding 2.28 times 10 to the fifth cells into each well. We know that given the surface area of these wells and the growth rate of these particular cells, you'll have a confluent monolayer by next week ready for the next phase of the project. So that's the rationale by dil for diluting to a certain cell concentration. And here's a quick demonstration of that. Here's your conical tube containing your cell suspension. And so you'll see you'll aseptically transfer 300 microliters to the various wells in the well plate. Now you'll be responsible for feeding your cells regularly. If you seed on a Wednesday, you should change your media again on Friday, then Monday, to remain on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. If you see it on a Tuesday, I would suggest changing media again on Wednesday, then Friday, and then Monday to avoid having to come to the lab over the weekend when there may not be somebody around to help you in the case of an emergency. Every time you come to change the media, you'll do the following procedure. Locate your group's media bottle in the fridge and place it in a water bath at 37 degrees C for 20 minutes to warm up. After the 20 minutes, you can remove it from the water bath, spray it down with alcohol, and then place it in the hood. Then you'll start to change the media on your well plate. What you'll do is remove 400 microliters of media from each well, and then add 600 microliters of fresh, warmed up media on top. Remember that the cells need to be covered with media at all times. Never let them dry out. Also, be careful not to disturb the monolayer with the pipette tip. So when dispensing media from the pipette, do it slowly, drop by drop, and dispense the droplets in the corner of the well only. And when you remove the media from the well plate, remember that that media that you removed gets dropped into the liquid waste with bleach. 
And also, you can use the same pipette tips for all the wells as long as you don't accidentally touch something that would cause contamination. And when you're not working with the cells, remember to incubate them at 37 degrees Celsius and 5% CO2 in one of our designated incubators. Now you will also have to come in on day six after reseeding. So for instance, if you seeded in class on a Wednesday, then you have to come back to the lab on Tuesday to do this part. Or if you seeded in class on Tuesday, then you have to come on Monday. And on this day, each team will receive a 1% uh, solution of sodium alginate, uh, which should be stored in the refrigerator with a designated team number. And you will make the alginate gels in the same way we did before in wells 6A through 6D. You will do this by pipetting 300 microliters of sodium alginate solution into each well and then carefully covering them each with calcium chloride solution, which will also be provided to you in the refrigerator. You should aim for adding about 700 microliters of calcium chloride to each well, but really you could just uh, do it until you cover the gel completely. And when you're finished, you'll cover the well plate again and place it back in the incubator for about 10 minutes just to let the gel solidify and firm up. After that time period, you will transfer them to overtop the cells in wells A1, A2, A3, and A4. To do the transfer, you can use the provided tweezers. However, you just have to make sure that the tweezers are sterile. So point them away from your samples but still keep them inside the hood and spray them with alcohol solution. Let them air dry for a minute or two and that should be sufficient to sterilize the surface of the tweezers. Just be sure to keep them in a sterile field and do not let them touch any surfaces that are not sterile. And row B can stay mostly as it is. It's the negative control. It provides conditions that we know allow for healthy cell morphology. While you're there, you should put fresh media on these monolayers. And then for row C, we want to do the positive cytotoxic control. So you will pipette out the media from the wells and add 300 microliters of cell culture grade methanol, which is provided to each group, which should kill the monolayer of cells. And once you're done, cover the well plate, incubate until day seven when we will assess the cell viability. Now on day seven, uh, this is your second uh, lab day, you'll be assessing cell morphology under the light microscope with phase contrast and you will be staining the cells with a live dead assay and examining them under the fluorescent bulb. So you'll start the day by giving your cells a warm PBS bath. You'll start by retrieving the PBS from the water bath. It was warm to 37 degrees. You'll spray it down and place it in the hood. And by warm PBS bath, what I mean is that you'll be pipetting off the existing media the alginate samples or the methanol from the wells and of course discarding this into the liquid waste container. You'll change pipette tips and then you'll add about 700 microliters of the warm PBS slowly to each well without disturbing the monolayer. And once you've added PBS to all the wells, you simply have to pipette it off and discharge it into the liquid waste. Now you've given your cells a bath and you're ready for the staining procedure. And for your reference, here's a quick example of the PBS wash or part of the PBS wash where you're opening the well plate and you're simply pipetting off the PBS that exists around the alginate gel. So you kind of just have to go around it in phases, maybe underneath it, and try to get up as much of the PBS uh, or the media, uh, whichever part you're on, from around the gels. Now we'll use a live dead viability kit uh, to examine the cell morphology and we'll use it according to the manufacturer's instructions. The kit contains two fluorescent dyes. One is called calcine AM and the other is called ephidium homodimer. Now calcine AM is well retained within live cells. 
it produces an intense, uniform green fluorescence when the cells are alive. However, the Ethidium homodimer enters cells with damaged membranes and undergoes a 40-fold enhancement of fluorescence upon binding to the nucleic acids, thereby producing a bright red fluorescence in dead cells. However, the Ethidium homodimer is excluded by intact plasma membrane of live cells. So for this procedure, you'll receive your live dead reagent and you'll add 300 microliters of the live dead mix to each well containing cells on your 24 well plate. You'll incubate that for 30 minutes at room temperature, okay, place the lid back on the well plate. And then at the end of the 30 minute incubation period, you'll add an additional 10 microliters of the live dead reagent to the samples and then you'll view them under the microscope. Now for the results analysis and discussion, you will make a presentation for the class that addresses the following points. For the first question, I'm asking you to make an observation and take pictures of the cell response to each condition, both under the light microscope and the fluorescence bulb. You are to interpret each condition, meaning your controls as well as your alginate gel, as non-cytotoxic, mildly cytotoxic, moderately cytotoxic, or severely cytotoxic. Your response to this question will be evaluated with the following rubric. Okay, next, for the second question, describe how the biocompatibility requirements used for scaffolds would be different than those used for biomaterials in long-term implantable devices. And again, your rubric is shown below. Next, Biocompatibility cannot be solely dependent on material characteristics, but also has to be defined by the situation in which the material is used. This is a quote about, about uh, the field of biomaterials and tissue engineering. I want you to fully explain this quote in your own words. Your answer will be addressed um, or assessed with the following rubric. In the next question, you'll have a quote that you have to fully explain in your own words. The quote is, biocompatibility cannot be solely dependent on the material characteristics, but also has to be defined by the situation in which the material is used. Your evaluation of this quote will be assessed using the rubric below. For the fourth discussion, describe the use of high throughput biocompatibility assays for fast screening of a large number of candidate materials. Summarize a published example of this type of study. What are the advantages? And in the next discussion question, you'll describe the use of high throughput biocompatibility assays for fast screening of a large number of candidate materials. Summarize a published example of this type of study. What are the advantages of this approach as compared to the cytotoxicity assay we did? And there's the rubric for this question. Okay. And the fifth question, one response to implantation of a foreign material that may be considered biocompatible for some applications is the formation of a stable fibrous capsule. For each of the following medical implants, state whether the result of a fibrous capsule would or would not be considered a biocompatible outcome and briefly explain why. If not, describe a more positive outcome. 
An implantable artificial pancreas. Assume the device is made up of a semi-permeable membrane enclosing the pancreatic cells and that the encapsulated cells respond to glucose levels in the surrounding bodily fluids and secrete insulin as needed. Next, a silicone breast implant that serves a primarily aesthetic function. Your assessment of each of these scenarios will be evaluated with the following rubric. And finally, you decide to use a tissue engineering ap approach where a scaffold with no cells is implanted and the surrounding cells will infiltrate the implant and start the regeneration process. To aid in cell infiltration, a chemical agent will be loaded into the scaffold and released upon implantation to attract neighboring cells. How would you determine whether this chemical ag agent has a cytotoxic effect in an in vitro test? provide a summary of a similar or relevant study reported in the peer-reviewed literature. And your rubric for question number six is shown below.